Turn it off now. We are now going live. Let's. Okay. Hi everybody, welcome to the live stream for uh, this month and um, it's uh, great to see people coming in on the comments so um, it will definitely be um, good to have some interaction with you guys as well as you're all aware. Um, today's session is on force testing um, but let's do a quick round of um, set up and admin. As you can see here we've got our uh, YouTube comments box so uh, we'll be keeping an eye on that and uh, the one thing that I did forget uh, last time which I was castigated for by uh, um, one of the members of our team is to uh, to like and subscribe just down here so uh, feel free to uh, keep going in that regard um, let's move on to uh, the next part let's just talk uh, a little bit about what you're uh, getting into here so um, circus rigging and safety is a free information service uh, for people about safety in circus. Uh, there is a little bit of a focus on rigging, but we've also covered things like COVID-19, and we cover lots of other areas as well uh, when it comes to um, safety in circus. So uh, there is a public area, which is the majority of the site, and there's a, a member area which gives you access to early release information and also a back catalogue of uh, videos as well. So um, our main objective is to provide um, free but uh, good quality information on safety in circus. So what I'm going to do first of all is introduce you to the team for today that we have here. We have uh, Chris Higgs um, joining us. Hi Chris. Hi there. And uh, Ryan Watson too. Hello. Good stuff. So um, now with the three of us who are in here, we're going to be moving into um, different aspects of um, force testing for today. And then we'll come back in and have uh, conversations about each of the elements that we're going to look at. So we're going to start today with an interview um, with Marion Cossin. Um, we're then going to go on and have a look at some of the force testing data that's been collected in the UK. Um, I want to have a look at different testing methodologies so we can look and see um, what's good, what's bad and have a discussion about that. Um, and a little bit of a discussion about load cells as well at the same time. So before we move into the, uh, the next um, part um, of the conversation, um, I think we should introduce Marion Cossin because um, I didn't um, invite her uh, specifically to speak live at this particular event, uh, which may actually have been a better way of to allow her to present her data. Um, so I chose to take the time to um, experiment a little bit what we were doing um, and have a recorded conversation with her. So um, the recorded conversation was about 90 minutes um, in length and I cut that down to about half an hour. So there's ultimately going to be two versions. So there's a half an hour version which goes into a lot of uh, different detail which we'll publish over the next week or so. And this version that you're going to see here is a 15 minute version of that interview about Marion's research. So um, why um, she pops up on our radar quite frequently is because um, she is the engineer who works at um, Ecole Nationale de Cirque um, and has released, along with uh, some of her um, partners there, uh, some research uh, documents. First of all, this was part of her master's research um, that she was in, involved in, which I think was released in 2015. Um, and then to go on further beyond that, uh, released further data on that in 2017. So she's going to tell us all about that and a little bit more uh, of the sorts of research that she's going to be getting to next. And we want to have a discussion about the impact of that data on the rigging world as well. So let's introduce you to Marion and let's go from here. So my name is uh, Marion Cossin and I'm uh, an engineer. I did uh, my, a master's degree in engineering in France, and after that, I moved to Canada in 2012. Definitely and I did a uh, master's degree in mechanical engineering, in which I did my, my project that you, you talked about, the paper. And now I'm in a PhD. I continued in a biomedical engineering. I'm mostly doing uh, biomechanics with acrobats. 
And uh, in addition, I now work uh, as an engineer of research at the CRITAC, uh, which is a center of research in circus arts. So the name is Center of Circus Arts Research Innovation and Knowledge Transfer. Yes. <laughs> So before my uh, master's degree, I used to work in the entertainment industry. I work for uh, theater uh, festivals or uh, opera to, uh, to better design um, um, a piece of equipment uh, for, for the entertainment industry. And I started uh, to work in the circus uh, industry uh, just before my master's degree. So my project uh, during my master's degree was uh, one of the first in the circus industry. Uh, what, what sort of forces are we finding that have been generated? So yeah, I measured the forces in five aerial discipline, which is uh, straps, uh, rope, uh, dance strapes, uh, silk, and aerial hoop. And the maximum force I measured was in a strap, and it was uh, eight times the body weight of the acrobats. After that, we have the rope uh, six times, uh, dance strapes, and silks was five times and aerial hoop was uh, three times. Anyway, in aerial hoop, um, I had mostly a contortionist or really static movement. So maybe the num number I had, I measured was not the, the, the real one, uh, but I have some news to, <laughs> to say. I conducted a new research a few weeks ago uh, with a new uh, disciplines uh, with other disciplines and also I did again uh, the the aerial hoop so I will have new value to provide in a few weeks I hope a few months <laughs> so let's delve a little bit more into a little bit more detail with regards to um, your data so I've extracted this uh, table from your master's research and uh, um, just to cover each one of these the uh, uh, second column is the actual uh, maximum braking load in kilonewtons for the circus equipment and the hanging point being the rigging point that we're suspending from being 15 kilonewtons and of course the max force that you recorded against each one of those um, disciplines and we can see the last two columns are where we're actually interpreting some of that data, the equipment design factor, uh, obviously the difference between the max force and the circus equipment itself, and the hanging point design factor, the difference between the max force and the, uh, the rigging point itself. Yes, exactly. Excellent. And what we can see is that the, for the uh, rigging equipment, so uh, the, the hanging part, uh, the lowest uh, factor is for strap. So, if I would uh, advise something for riggers, it's like to be careful when you have to rig strap, you need to maybe reinforce your rigging equipment. And uh, for the design factor, the real design factor of the apparatus, the, the equipment, the lowest was for the silk. There is um, a sort of uh, a, a comprehension out there at the moment that there's a difference between beginners and more advanced students on the forces that they generate. So what did you find in your research? So yeah, so I measured the forces uh, with the three uh, levels of the three years of the National Circus School of Montreal. And there is no significant differences between beginners and more advanced students. Uh, however, <laughs> I need to, <laughs> to talk a bit about that. Uh, so the difference is not, what I saw, what I observed is like the difference is not uh, related to the level of students, but mostly uh, about the, the kind of movement. If you have, a, I would say, a more passive movement, sometimes something, for example, like the uh, slack drop in rope or silk, you will have no difference between beginners and advanced students. Uh, because it's, uh, it depends more about uh, the, the, the loop of the equipment or the elasticity of the equipment, but the acrobat does not have an active, uh, uh, it does not, is not active in the movement. But if you have a more active movement, for example, a dislock in a uh, uh, strap, uh, you will see differences between beginners and advanced students. And mostly what I observe is that uh, advanced students uh, will generate less forces than the beginner's movement. And also, uh, I haven't said before, but I'm doing a PhD now in uh, uh, Korean Tito Board. 
so I measured also the, the, the impact forces in uh, Korean T2 boat. And what I see is difference between the more experienced uh, acrobats uh, versus the less experienced. And I think it's it's it, it's kind of um, you can feel it when you start a new movement or a new sport you don't know how to 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 do the the movement so sometimes you will have do uh, you will put a lot of force uh, and it's not required because as soon as you understand how it works you will optimize your force and you will know when to uh, to to do a lot of efforts and when to reduce uh, for example the impact so uh, yes you will you will have a difference in this kind of uh, movement, I would say like active movement. Sure, so um, th there's definitely the differences in those um, forces then between um, beginners and more experienced people, as more experienced people tend to be optimized. Yes. Uh, are, we all, are we seeing in any way that in some cases, um, some of the more advanced techniques require more advanced acrobatic ability, which takes more time to generate to be able to generate those sorts of forces. Yes, exactly. Yes, yeah. So, could you give any examples for that? Um, but I would say the the strap is a really good example because uh, it's not a, a discipline. It's, it's a discipline that requires a lot of uh, technique and a lot of strength. Uh, and for beginner, you will 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 not do uh, high dynamic movements. So it's. It's uh, it's for uh, it's mostly for uh, advanced uh, uh, acrobats, and in this part in this movement you will see differences between uh, more advanced uh, acrobats and uh, less uh, and beginners. So um, the people that you've been researching are all Ecole Nationale de Cirque yes. um, people, so they're all ready um, at a very high standard. That yes. we're looking at. Um, has there been much in the way of research done from a more recreational perspective uh, or youth circus perspective? Excellent question. Uh, I would say no, I don't know. I'm not aware of that. Uh, maybe there is, but I'm, I'm not aware of that. Uh, but what I can say is that some movement I measure was uh, they can be done by beginners. Like, for example, there is a fall in silk that generates the, my maximum force five times, uh, the body weight, and it's really a beginner movement. It's just a foot key. I don't know, eight foot key, yeah. and you release, and you are, you are, you're, doing, you're doing like a pendulum. And this is the kind of movement that can be done by beginners and can generate a lot of first forces. Uh, so you can see there is a it's the, the 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 pattern in forces is more related to the kind of movements uh, mostly uh, more than uh, and mostly also discipline because some discipline we have some uh, for example in strap in um, silk and rock we will have more mostly falls between uh, compared to uh, to straps where else you will have more dynamic swinging movements and in this part you will have uh, you will need a more uh, advanced level for this kind of movements very good actually um yeah i mean that's good to know because uh, obviously um we're looking there is a, a there is a common belief uh, as that the beginners can't generate high forces and this is not what i measured uh, and how i think it would be really good to uh, to provide more data on recreational uh, uh, artists excellent if we were looking at creating a standardized way of recording this data so that it could be done globally Yes. What would you recommend? Uh, so we use the load cell, uh, which is like a, a force sensor, uh, but it allows to have a lot of uh, points per second uh, so that you can have a detailed analysis. And for example, you have you can synchronize uh, video and force data, uh, which is better than a, a, a dynamometer is good also, but it doesn't have a, a high sampling frequency. And sometimes you can have only the maximum value. It records only one value. Uh, me, I had the whole uh, force data uh, with, um, during the time. So we uh, attach a load cell uh, between the equipment and the, the cable, the rigging uh, system. And I had the sampling frequency of uh, 100 Hertz, uh, which is uh, 100 points per second. Uh, which is a bit low. Uh, I was uh, when I I, I uh, wanted to publish my paper. Uh, the 
was a bit low for this kind of uh, study. So my last study I did, <laughs> we increased the sampling frequency of 2000 uh, hertz. Uh, I think we are good, no? <laughs> so yeah, because you can miss, uh, in, in the study, I didn't think uh, I missed uh, the, the, the maximum forces because even at uh, 100 hertz, you can see it's uh, still, the peak are still smooth. But just to be sure, we increase the sampling frequency. Uh, also, it's better to have a lot of repetition in science. Uh, you, 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 you want, you need to have repetition of movement and also a lot of uh, subjects. It's better to have a lot of uh, participants. Yeah, definitely. Very good. Um, did you have a way of synchronizing the video to the, what did you use to, to synchronize that to the, the load cell? So yeah, we use the software called LabView. Uh, so it uh, allows us to uh, record the, the, the false data and also to synchronize the, the camera that we used uh, uh, during the measurements. Uh, because what I used, I, I had some programmers to do the LabView program uh, and it's also really expensive. So it's mostly for research, I would say. Uh, it's not the best, uh, best equipment for uh, for uh, rigors, I would say, or for the circus industry, because it does not have the same uh, uh, um, requirements of specification, I would say. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so also I, in the study, we had 16 students from the National Circus School, and in total, I measured more than 300 movements. Uh, and it's uh, 49 different uh, kind of movement with a repetition of uh, between five and 10 times. Uh, we asked the student to um, record the movement at the end of their class. So I was, I came at the end of the class, put my equipment, do the, the movement, and each week during three months, I measured the, the movement. Um, so also there can be a bit of a, a learning uh, pattern in the, the, in the, the, how I measured it. But, uh, the best way would be like to measure it for uh, one day every participant so that they, they can have the same uh, test protocol, the same test conditions. Uh, that's what I did last time also. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> to, <laughs> to say, I conducted a new research a uh, few weeks ago uh, with uh, new uh, disciplines, uh, with other disciplines. And also I did again uh, the, the aerial hoop. So I will have new value to provide in a few weeks, I hope a few months. <laughs> Very good. So, yeah. Is, is there any sort of uh, sneak previews that you can give us at this stage? <laughs> but in rope and aerial hoop, I measured uh, higher forces. Uh, in silk, I measured like uh, three uh, kind of um, uh, silk, so three kind of elasticity. Uh, so we wanted to measure the difference in uh, elastic uh, elasticity. And I also did the measurement in uh, swinging trapeze, uh, fixed trapeze duo and solo, uh, Chinese nice. wall, tight wire and um, and flying flying oh yeah so amazing new results i'm so excited <laughs> <laughs> well i can imagine there's quite a lot of other people who are going to be excited to hear about that so uh, perhaps uh, when you're ready to release all of that um we can come back together and yeah. um you can tell us all about that as well which i think will be really good, good. excellent <laughs> stuff so uh hang on a second just play with my audio settings. There we go. So I have to thank uh, Marion very much for uh, consenting to that interview and sharing her research with us. And um, that uh, there's a longer conversation which we'll um, put up on YouTube um, in the next few days um, if you want some more uh, detail in some of those areas. So um, first of all, very much thank you to Marion. Um, but also um, one of the things uh, of having good proper scientific research done um, in there. It's it's one of the few things that, um, that has been done so far. So out of the interview um, I, that um, uh, we had together, there's, there's obviously some interesting data um, to be uh, discussed as part of that. Um, uh, and I just want to touch on um, some of those with uh, Chris and Ryan as well to, to, to continue that um, theme, if you like. And um, let me just... Uh, bring everybody back in the room. Um, hi guys. So um, I thought good interview, um, good data. Obviously, I, I know that, uh, I think Ryan, you've read the paper, haven't you? I don't know, Chris, if you've uh, seen it before? I certainly sort of skimmed through it when it first came out, I believe, yes. But I, I wouldn't, um, wouldn't profess to have a sort of working knowledge of it. 
No problem. So um, with regards to um, the uh, the details that are in there, there's a few interesting things for me which came um, out of that. One of those um, was, and that actually came from the longer interview, was, was very much um, a discussion about US um, practices and methodologies where um, having the concept of 10 times body weight being what everybody was working to. Um, not even anything to do with whatever the dynamic forces which were being yeah, uh, being applied um, uh, within that. So that, that was one thing which came up in the, uh, the longer version of that conversation. Um, so the other areas were the differences between um, uh, beginner and more experienced students. Um, and the difference between, um, or the very little difference between uh, performing and um, training. And I think those are some of the things that we discussed when we were talking about um, forces last month um, in particular. And she's not seeing a great deal of difference between them, uh, but references another paper um, that where they saw higher forces in training um, and lower forces um, in actual performance. Um, one of the questions that I raised with her was that if we had people who are much less used to performing, like many uh, of our recreational students, then adrenaline may play um, a slightly bigger force. But obviously, that's not something we have any d data on uh, 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 at this stage, and is is pretty much just speculation. So. Um, the other uh, elements that are in there, if we want to think about um, uh, the two different sides of that. So one of those was um, ending up with something like 2.8 as a factor of safety for silks, for the silk itself. Um, and then something different again between um, the rigging point for straps itself, because the straps itself was quite robust. Um, but we were actually um, at you know somewhere between two and three times body weight for um, uh, the rigging point. So, uh, uh, Ryan, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think the the uh, National Circus School of Montreal, where the testing was done, I think that's what they sort of calculated after having done the tests that the sort of minimum safety factor that they'd sort of achieved after the result, based on the numbers of the testing, was two point eight. And yeah. the recommendations made in the paper were, um, I remember, the, the, uh, basically the recommendations were based on a safety factor of four. So there was yeah. different recommendations for the um, suspension point. I think it was 22 kilonewton. Yeah. And then there was recommendations made for rope and silk and uh, different apparatus. And they were all based on a safety factor of four. And that's, I mean, that that's a point of discussion there because it's, it's just a number at the end of the day, four, where does it, where does it come from? Why not yep. two? Why not five? And there's a bit of discussion in there and discussion around the testing, having a limited number of people for one, even if you're yep. doing testing, is it going to change during the performance? So I, I don't think we want a safety factor of 1.1, 1 .1. but, uh, <laughs> but for, but four, you just got to take it with a pinch of salt, probably unless you're at the national circus school of Montreal, where maybe you've got to use four. Well, let's see what comes out of that. So, uh, Chris, also, like all, all of the um, the figures in there are quoting maximum braking load. How how would we apply that to a situation with truss, uh, for example? Are we we're just going to go with uh, what we see as that maximum load for the discipline, or what are your thoughts? Um, I think if you're talking about an anchor point or two anchor points for a trapeze, for example, um, then yeah, you just tr treat the maximum force that the structure is likely to see. But it's clearly very different if it's going to be um, repeated over a period of time or you're moving the points to different places or you've got multiple points on the same truss as you often find in studios. Um, but all these things can be engineered. You know, I, I don't think there's a there's ever going to be a point at which people say, stop, you can't do it. It's impossible. It's always going to be possible. But it's just a question of having a, a good brief um, of what you want to do. And I suppose importantly, particularly in the sort of the training environment. And it's interesting that Marion's figures really bear out what a lot of us, I think, have, have known for some time, that when you're rehearsing or training, really you're just bouncing up and down on the bed. You know, where it comes to performance, it's a very short duration. It might be on a fresh point, so to speak. Um, however, that's achievable it's because it's in a different building for one show at a time. Um, obviously, if you, it becomes a, a house show or 
Cirque in Vegas or something like that, then clearly the same thing um, is going to apply as it does to trusses. But that can be engineered. You know, I think it's, it's probably the balance between um, production value and budget, really. It's not an unusual equation, is it? Yeah, indeed. Indeed. Good. So um, where we are uh, looking at there, that's obviously there's a certain amount of research which has been done up to sort of the, uh, the 2017 mark and we're a few years beyond that. And it's good to hear also um, that um, uh, Marion has continued to do further research in that area, but also mentioned that she'd had uh, registered higher loads on hoop uh, predominantly because in the, the first set of testing she's working mainly with uh, hoop contortionists um, so the numbers there are, um, are, are, are higher um, and I'm hoping that if um, if the research gets published over the next few weeks then uh, one of the things that I'd very much like to do is ask Marion to come and actually present that um, information live as part of our technical symposium in October uh, because Just, then we um, can actually ask people to, to another go ahead, go. A little note on that. I think it was something really good that they included in the paper. So on, on making single point aerial circus disciplines safer, page 20, they've written, the participants in aerial hoop did not perform very dynamic movements. They performed contortions. It was also very difficult for them to do the movements because of the reaction induced by the mass of the load cell. So I think that's a really good point that they've made there just to sort of consider the effect that the testing you're doing is having on the system and then yeah. by, by extension on the results that you're getting. Uh, it's very good that they sort of included that in there for the rest of us reading. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 um, there's definitely a few things to come um, out of that if we want to look at where things can go next because in, in the world that we live in, in the main, we're not really set up to do the same level of um, rigor uh, when it comes to testing things um, uh, like that. And uh, I think that's something uh, uh, perhaps we'll have a look at in just a second. Um, one of the things I'd like to uh, uh, also have a look at that then is the data that we've already recorded um, in the UK. So um, one of those um, things we get, uh, all, that I've uh, collated together from data that people have shared with me um, from the testing that they've done in the UK, if, we, if you went into the professionals area of uh, circus rigging and safety and then um, scroll down um, to the bottom, there's a, um, a link, an embedded table there. And um, we can actually uh, show that in a little bit more uh, detail and uh, uh, collated each one of those there. Now, uh, Marion did 302 um, uh, piece data points that uh, she collected um, across those disciplines. We've got um, less than that, 56 records, I think. Um, so uh, a much a smaller number, but done over a, a, perhaps a, a different set of circumstances, um, which, which is worth uh, perhaps having a look at. So, I mean, the way that we've recorded this is with an ID which identifies, you know, a number and um, what it relates to, the equipment that it relates to, um, and then a name, which is obviously a perilous thing to title in any research, um, because obviously people name things very differently. And then from that, for each one of those, we also recorded the, uh, the weight of the performer and the weight of the equipment. And there's obviously some variables around that, um, depending on um, what we're looking at. Um, the combined weight and then the peak force and then the force factor. So um, definitely not collecting quite as broader uh, data set as Marion uh, w was recording there. Um, but equally, we can go and have a look and see what some of these um, force factors are uh, that we're recording. Because we've obviously got nowhere near eight, um, but we're also um, in the data that we've got, we're not necessarily dealing with the same um, sets of, uh, of people. And I think the National Centre in um, London have collected a little bit more data subsequently to this. Uh, which would be interesting to add in to, to what we're doing here. But if we're we're looking and seeing, we've got uh, you know 4.5, 4.5, 4.5, and, um, and uh, if, in fact, if we go all the way down to the bottom, we've managed to get a 17.8. Um, but that was for um, uh, a um, a dead weight uh, being dropped and a dead weight of I think 13.5 kilos. Um, now. The the parts that we uh, did include um, as part of this was also uh, the the test graph um, image so that we could see uh, get that um, uh, captured and you'll start to see a pattern forming here as well um, but also uh, things like the uh, um, the video itself so if I went up to here and pop this one up then we can see that 
Yeah. So uh, th this would have been um, the resultant graph along with the um, the activity that was happening um, at the same time. So um, very much um, a different range of people who were participating um, in these uh, activities as we go through. And like th the value for me in this is that the video is basically showing us visually what activity uh, was going ahead and we built a catalogue of those which is quite useful and then um, interpolated the graph uh, that was in there. I think there's some dangers to that which we can perhaps have a bit of a chat about um, in a minute um, when it comes to um, Bluetooth apps um, from some of the conversations that's been going on over the last month or so but um, equally it's quite a small data set. So um, guys what are your um, thoughts on, hang on a second, let me pop you up. Um, what are your thoughts on the um, uh, on the data that's been recorded and its contrast to um, what Marion has been working with? Oh, hang on a second. I haven't got. I can't hear you, Chris. Is that at my end? Oh, sorry. Oh, I, there I we go. Oh. Audio saves on so live streams. Um, <laughs> I'd have to look at the numbers to to really sort of get a feel for it, but I think. You know, the greatest respect to everybody that's that's tried. I've done some myself. They're just numbers, um, and it depends so much on the context of what you're trying to achieve. Is it because you're trying to achieve a, a safer or better rigging point? Is it, um, you know, are you are you a studio? Is it a production um, festival? Is it in a tent? You know, there's there's so many different requirements that people have, and seeing traditionally it's the same across the industry, isn't it? I want to do this, what do I need to do? Well, if it's never been done before, nobody knows. Um, and to find out costs money, and that's why typically that's where it stops, or people just use their best endeavors of common sense, if you like. Um, but I think the important thing is you, we can start to build a picture um, or even a reference work so people have some sort of idea as to the, the ballpark they're playing in, really. Yes. Um, so if you are doing, I don't know, uh, you're flying somebody on straps or something like that, then that's a fairly major undertaking. You've got to make very sure what's going on because you've got big, big movements in one plane and you've got a lot of um, impulse loads um, in, a, in another at the same time. You know, and it, it, it can be engineered. Of course it can, anything can, but it, that takes time and money. Um, and that's very often what people don't have or, or can't see the um, the association with, I suppose. You know, yeah. You're making it difficult. <laughs> that yeah, kind indeed. of attitude to it. Unfortunately, it's true. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, some of the things that are in there, like um, um, uh, one of Marion's papers alludes to some of the older thinking we used to have. Um, before sort of 2015, 2017, where there was um, a rule of thumb which was applied to two times body weight for static and five times body weight for dynamic. And I think that doing this research and continuing to build this up builds a much bigger picture um, over time for each of these uh, different things. But there's also, um, I, I was delivering a rigging course this last week um, for the subject of aerial pilates and then um, was asked the question about some of the things which are available on US websites which are definitely recommending um, screwing eye bolts into wooden um, uh, roof beams uh, with some very flimsy looking uh, parts and you look at that and uh, um, they're recommending two times body weight um, because that's all they're expecting to see and we know that even just sitting in a hammock and wriggling around a bit you're going to see three times so um, uh, the more yeah, I think that was the, the the best result of that paper was just shattering some of these uh, general sort of assumptions or rules of thumb as Marion pointed out there's a pretty limited uh, amount of testing done and to sort of make new rules or whatever out of that it isn't yeah. really possible but it was a very good illustration of how some of these other ones like the the classic 10 times body weight um maybe sometimes it's got some value but a lot of times it's just it's just a number that plucked out of the air because yeah. 10 sounds really nice i mean it's, it's probably not much more to it than that but um for the for this for all of this testing especially the the group testing like what marion or you, yourself have done for that to get best use in the broader community i think what really needs to be established is is a testing protocol 
or, or at least some guidelines giving, you know, as Marion pointed out, um, the sampling rate, you know, what's the sort of minimum sampling rate? Um, how, how, is, how is the testing going to be conducted? And then how is it going to be written up? And then instead of having a test of a few hundred samples and a test of 50 and a test of three with a show, if there's enough common ground between how the testing's done and how it's written up, then we can start building up a, a body of uh, data and, and start drawing some conclusions from thousands of tests instead of five, ten, hundred at a time. Yeah. yeah. I think building that picture is um, something that's um, definitely interesting. Um, but also this test setup um, it, itself is, um, I, I think, a, a key thing. And it's also defining what's necessary and uh, whether there's different levels of quality in the data that we're ultimately providing. So um, in the example that's here, um, which I uh, borrowed from uh, Marion's master's uh, uh, paper, you've got the load cell at the bottom just above the hoop, and then you've got the transmitter that's just above that. You've then got the receptor for the load cell, which plugs into a computer, um, and then a camera, which also plugs into the same um, computer as well. And then using some uh, complex research software to actually synchronize the video um, with that and um, obviously that software is um, considerably easier to uh, or better to synchronize as uh, it, when you were watching Marion's video you probably noticed that the um, in a couple of cases I'd not managed to synchronize the graph um, that was moving at the same pace as it was uh, uh, the person and that's obviously um, that, that's something I need to try and fix before we publish it I just didn't have quite as much time as I'd have uh, uh, liked to to pull that together um, so uh, that's something here which is useful but I think that if we're looking at what people are doing and we're just looking for peak load um, but and then looking for because I think it very very like I think it very unlikely that in a recreational class in an aerial studio um, for one person being on it that they're rarely going to achieve eight times body weight on um, most of the other activities um, but just building up a body of evidence and seeing which area you work in and building your uh, method statements to limit you within what you're doing is 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 one approach um, and, and the more awareness we have of the forces that are involved, I think, um, uh, the better. Yeah. So, what? So, I mean, uh, Ryan, you've mentioned a few um, elements when it comes um, to to actually that sort of data um, and the different parameters that are associated with it. Um, I think videoing it is an important part of that, obviously. The synchronization of it, I'm thinking it's it's useful, and if we want to say we've got the highest quality of data, but it's also a very expensive proposition um, if we're going to do that to a, a rigorous scientific standard, and uh, Marion mentioned about that in her um, I interview. Um, but we can kind of see what the peak forces are, and we can sort of pretty much figure out as um, uh, where that fits within that. Um, the other equation is the load cell. So, um, and we've got obviously um, a whole world of different sorts of uh, load cells um, that are out there at the moment. And obviously they're created to be of um, the best quality for what we can use. Um, if we're buying them, they tend to be relatively expensive. Um, if we are, depending on what we're going to use them for, how often we're going to use them. Um, if we are renting them, um, then in the UK at least, they're relatively inexpensive. But then it's also defining um, which ones are actually going to be good for different sets of um, circumstances. What, 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 what do you think um, uh, when it comes to the types of load cells and things related to that? Yeah, I mean, the classic one on the market in in the aerial use is definitely the enforcer isn't it it's sort of reasonably cost efficient and uh it's got a 500 per second sampling rate on sand fast i mean it's a pretty good balance it's pretty affordable but like you say there's a ton of them out there and sampling rates definitely one of the more important characteristics if you, you know you're doing dynamic activities but um the 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 range that it's the accuracy and the range is is uh is also there so there's new line scale line what is it line grip line scale yeah. by one of those slack lining companies that's i think in its third generation now and and pegged to come out later this year it's got some really good qualities but the 
just having another look at over the last week, one of the things that really stands out as a big question mark is um, the uh, what is it? The the accuracy is given to plus minus 0.25 percent between three and 15 kilonewtons. So that's you know what is it below three kilonewtons and what are you measuring are the sort of questions you need to ask. But other than those, I mean, you start getting into sort of um, not to say they're not professional, but they perhaps more sort of heavy heavy duty things, and you quickly run into you know a couple of thousand pound and, and up. Um, so yeah, it's, I mean, I think establishing a sort of guidance on uh, what qualities to look for to help punters if they're going to rent the things, or, or just speaking to the companies and, and getting an idea from them. But a lot of these manufacturers, if they're dealing with industry and lifting, their idea of what a dynamic lift might be it could be very different to what is happening in aerial. True, Chris. Yeah, I'd I'd agree completely. I mean, I've got quite a lot of experience working with Alon Engineering in, in Israel, um, and they produce a range of stuff which is, I think, one of the, um, the sort of the larger players in the entertainment industry applications. And you've got Straight Point and Broadway and some of these other um, the Kinesis products and so forth. But as Ryan says, you know, it's a bit like the slacklining one. That was presumably the brief to the, the people that actually make them. Um, it's under constant tension. And the kind of tensions they're talking about, by definition, are going to be somewhere in the sort of 700 kilos force plus um, before you even start. Um, and certainly, I mean, I used to use a thing called an Enerpack years ago, which was a hydraulic cylinder um, with an analog dial on it. But it was phenomenally accurate for tightrope type reading. Um, but the reality was you put somebody that weighs, I think it was 75 kilos or something in the barn um, in the middle and um, it barely doubles the force in the wire, you know. There's, there's so many things at play, which I think, as you said before, this data is going to, it, it, it could confuse. So we need to be very clear about the, the protocols used to make sure that you're either hanging it on perhaps some steel wire rope of a certain construction or a chain, which is why I'm sure a lot of the uh, lanyard testing standards and so forth use chain, because then the extensibility is, is kind of guaranteed, uh, or a known, a known factor at least. Whereas if uh, I found myself, we got some really high figures um, doing things like catches drops on aerial hoop. Um, but by definition, because the, the tab in the top of the hoop accepted a certain size pin, it meant that the shackle used was sort of screaming out for a six mil steel wire rope or quarter inch wire rope, um, which meant that it was hung on a, on a length of five or six length of steel or something. Now I'm sure if we'd got a grid height that was three times that, and we put an 18 foot length of six mil rope, we'd have got very different figures. Um, and the fact that there was, um, I think it was a, a direct fixing to the, to the I-beams that were the supporting structure whereas the silks have been put on a round sling. Um, you know, it, it's just simple things like that can make the world a difference. Um, and it's not difficult. I mean, you, you could set out and decide how you're going to do it. One on a beam clamp, one on a round sling, on a double part or choked or, you know, some specification. Um, and then a steel wire rope of a particular construction, because again, they vary hugely. Um, yeah. Or is it on, as a lot of studios do now, is it going to utilize some sort of lifting system in order to allow the rigging to take place at ground level? because then you know the loads at the top end are very different. Um, we certainly found in the way that it, it's distributed onto a truss, for example, um, the engineers were actually really quite, quite happy about the way that it was helping to load the truss. Um, you know, you've got two parts to a pulley, as it were, so that it can be rigged from both sides of a square truss, which is absolutely preferable. Uh, and straight away, you know, you're talking engineers' language now, rather than presenting them with, well, it's a dance trapeze and it's on this and it does that. Um, you know, they won't necessarily um, be able to optimise what we need to do in an engineering sense, I suppose. Yeah, indeed. Let's um, have a quick um, look at the chat 
and see um, what's been going on there because there's uh, definitely been a few um, comments and questions uh, along the way. So, um, yep, thank you, Andy. That was um, uh, great to uh, hear so much good information from uh, Marion, which is uh, which is good. Um, I've not been keeping quite as uh, much um, uh, in sync with this, and also there's a little bit of a gap between what we're seeing here. Um, and what we're then um, uh, uh, timing when it comes to uh, to YouTube. So I'm not going to uh, necessarily have all of the, the reference with that, but uh, the ability to um, have data and graphics and video together to be able to see stuff is quite useful because you can also see the type of person that's doing it as well, at least from my point of view. Um, test protocol, standardized approach with proper calibration. And I think uh, Max brings that in later. Calibrated in what time frame prior to testing? And I think that um, one of the points that um, uh, we raised, and I think Chris raised it um, actually when it came to the uh, documentation we put together on force testing, one of the considerations you're looking at is the calibration um, of uh, your devices to make sure that they're you know, um, properly calibrated. Um, and it says precision is more relevant than accuracy for a load cell used to measure dynamic circus forces in a way. Um, so, uh, and cheap. I think, we, did we cover cheap, whether it was cheap? I think like the, the line scale three was sub $800, something like that. I seem to remember, and I, I can't remember what the, Why? Oh, I see. So, so Max is uh, is uh, um, showing his uh, media uh, uh, training in here in some way. Uh, curious why is using film video industry time code clapperboard isn't used. Um, I know, I know why it wasn't used in the ones that um, uh, people have shared with me. Um, uh, just too many balls to juggle and it was riggers sitting around with artists um, uh, just playing around and having an experiment making sure we got it on video if you have a look at the ones from the the national um, center which are the ones starting with the NC code then you got a little whiteboard that they're holding up with uh, all the, the relevant stats uh, on it up the front and then showing the video and then showing the graph at the end so you can actually see that but yeah I mean if we could actually animate one and the other I think that's probably part of um, one of the one of the next discussions um, so I know that there's been, um, and I think, uh, yeah, Roger is on the, the, the chat as well. I know there's been um, a discussion about the Rock Exotica Enforcer um, and some of the questions that have been raised, because one of the things that you notice about all of the UK data and all of the videos that you've seen playing in the background here, we've used that because it was um, the most readily accessible um, device for us for actually testing in Circus, which didn't require you to um, rent something and then install software on a PC when we all have Macs um, and other things like that. So um, uh, that was quite good. But also the conversation is that some people are reporting, and I don't know how valid this is, a, a difference between um, what's happening on the device itself and what they're seeing in the app. And that may be because of the Bluetooth connection between them. And I know that um, what we have to do is we have to send someone up the leg of the rig um, in a harness, clip them in, and they sit there with the device recording it because on the ground it's too far away. One of the things... Yeah, go ahead. So, I mean, one of the things we were looking at when we were trying to run the uh, technical symposium last year in May, and then it turned out we had to do it virtually, which ended up us being where we are today, um, we were looking at doing swinging trapeze, flying trapeze, and, and the, the rock enforcer, uh, the um, rock exotica enforcer, um, would not have been the right device for, um, for, for doing that with. So we were looking at other things, and then we were coming into sort of constraints for things like, um, okay, well, this only has uh, leads which will go to 10 meters and other things like that when you're plugging it in manually. So obviously finding the right device and calibrating it right would be a good thing to do.
Oh, hang on a second. We appear to not be... They uh, seem to have lost audio somewhere along the way um, that I'm hearing. Um, no sound coming. Couldn't hear the... Oh! Um, does someone want to... So if um, Chris and... That's good. That's from Chris. Ryan? Good. That's a definite audio thing that I'm hearing there. This is good. Um, so um, can anybody hear anybody else at the moment other than me just sticking something and I'll come back and have a look at the chat I mean I can hear you guys and I'm thinking that oh that's just come back up uh, couldn't hear any of that can we summarize they've just got me oh that's never a good thing um, oh hang on a second hang on a second let's go how about now I'm wondering if that's uh, uh, part of the uh, um, the factor because uh, I'm, I'm on, uh, there we go, they can hear us now. My apologies. Uh -huh. um, so we, we just missed the last few um, uh, seconds uh, um, of, of that. Um, and, oh no, uh, okay, we can only see, all right, okay. Um, right, okay, so I think we're back on, and I think we're in the right place. I think it's um, um, operator error, uh, rather than uh, the system breaking down more than anything else. Um, so um, when it comes to um, the conversation that we've just had, um, it was um, more about um, just having uh, the right devices. So Chris, could you say um, what uh, load cell that you've been testing recently? Yeah, well, I'm, for several years now, well, probably near 10 years actually, I've had quite a close association with a company in Israel called Alon, um, who've certainly done a lot of work in the entertainment industry, but their main, uh, they're mainly an industrial um, uh, company but the the system I've got from them at the moment uh, is completely wireless and you've got from, from memory I think I've said 800 meters range between the um, the transmitter and the iOS device that you use on the other end your iPhone or whatever um, but I've not found that to be a problem at all I know sampling rate is something that most people are very aware of um, but so long as you've got the peak hold feature as it were and you've actually got the the biggest figure is the one that you've got access to and certainly the Alon system will you can tell it to, to do all kinds of different reports um, which it does as a PDF um, as well as all the, the more sort of industrial things you'd expect like it if you set it up right it's been way way beyond my capabilities but if you get an overload on a system it'll text you you know that's, wow. that's yeah. Really, yeah quite apparently that's you know oh yeah Christ they all do that <laughs> still impresses me it's magic so I think using the right bit of kit um, is probably just knowing what questions to ask um, yeah. and, as always, a bit of budget. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the other issue that I'd seen, if we didn't want to rely on the Bluetooth element of the uh, of the Rock Exotica um, and we actually just wanted to use what was innately in there, I think it only records four seconds of each one and or a few five or six seconds of each one and then overwrites it after you've got four or five in there um, and also to auto trigger it um, it's set at two kilonewtons so from a 50 kilo circus performer perspective um, they may run a whole lot without ever um, uh, triggering four times body weight um, so I think as you uh, have said finding the right device for the right application um, and I think that's a, a conversation which can definitely go on beyond um, where we are now. Um, so like for us here, as well as everybody who's listening or who listens to this after the stream, um, please add some comments in for um, your thoughts on um, uh, the, the best devices and setups that we could uh, potentially be working with and to, to see some of the best ways of doing it. Obviously, uh, price uh, may be an issue, if we're, but there's very few of us who are doing this on an ongoing basis, and uh, the ability to be able to hire it, install it, and give it back afterwards would be quite good. Mm -hmm. At least, that may be my own personal use for it, but uh, um, maybe others have different uh, applications they want to use it for. Cool. Any, any last thoughts on um, testing or load cells as far as uh, uh, we're concerned here? I think the more people that can get involved and the, the broader the, um, the data we can get hold of, it, it can only help, as Ryan was saying. I mean, it's um, provided we've got the Either people are very careful to report how they've carried the test out, or we come up with five columns, you know, aerial, hoop on, span set, whatever. Um, 
it's got to bear fruit, hasn't it? And as Ryan said, you know, it's a question of starting to build up a picture which can be used for all sorts of things. You know, whether it's to help engineers or whether it's to help people um, just check that the, the figures they've been given are actually relevant to what their school's doing or what their show's doing. Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, the, the research that we've got at the moment is predominantly around um, uh, single point that we're working from uh, with, I mean, there's a couple of uh, double points uh, that we used two rock exoticas for when we were doing some of the testing in 2017. Um, and, um, uh, but in the main, it's static equipment. Um, the things I'm looking forward to is, is Marion's been doing it with swinging trapeze, which is what we'd intended to do last year, uh, but couldn't do it under the circumstances. So that will be interesting to see. But the other area that she's heading into is more to do with the human body. Um, and the forces that are applied on the human body and better training methods uh, with that as well. So I think that'll have a wider application where we're not just understanding the max force that's applied per discipline, but also how better to train it. Um, and, you know, looking at a wider data set to see that, okay, well, if you're training it, you know, less frequently, um, you'll actually make gains um, that much harder or have less injuries or those sorts of things. And there's um, obviously Kritak um, uh, that uh, she works with um, in Montreal is um, probably the, the, the major body for doing this sort of um, uh, research. So it's going to be interesting to keep an eye on that. And I'm really happy that they sort of publicly publish their data, which is really good. I was very interested for what I think she was saying was that actually it's the reverse of what you might imagine that um, beginners are generating, um, you know, forces that perhaps a professional, if you distinguish them that way, wouldn't. But it's, you know, the more practice you get and the fact that certainly when you do the show, you've got to account for adrenaline, but it's for a much shorter period of time. And it's after a, um, a sustained, one would assume, a sustained period of um, rehearsal or training so that people aren't landing on straight arms, as it were. Yeah. You know, the, the energy yeah. absorption that we can um, use in our bodies is going to be better the better we get at it. Um, not necessarily, because obviously things can go wrong, and maybe the, the sort of the design factor used, the, the, the more dynamic the act or the more risky the act to, to the, um, the athlete or the, the, the gymnast's acrobat's um, safety needs to be thought about. But again, the data can be used perhaps, you know, look at the forces we're getting when people do these complicated, I don't know, windmills or drops or whatever it might be. Um, because as you say, that we can sort of feed that back into the training regime, but it also helps the likes of the engineers and riggers because you think, well, actually that, although it looks pretty dynamic, it's not really generating very much at all, which is certainly what my experience points me towards. And I'm talking about essentially static stuff rather than um, flying trapeze, for example. But certainly on, on silks and ropes and things, you know, the numbers you get really are, to a rigor in, in the, the vast majority of venues really isn't an issue at all, um, contrary to popular belief. And there's, there's lots of other things that perhaps people need to think about rather than the numbers, as Ryan said. And um, that's sort of comfort value because it sounds good and I completely understand it. But is it actually necessary? Yeah, indeed. There's a, there's a few uh, comments here in the chat that might be worth um, Go ahead. addressing. One is uh, Andy Schmitz is asking for a link to Critac. That can probably be I can do that. put into the comments afterwards or something. Or, put that in the chat, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, there's also Gandalf SS, Gandalfs maybe, um, asking for brands and models of load cells, I assume. I don't, we don't really have a comprehensive list, but uh, the ones that we've talked about are the, the Rock Exotica Enforcer and the Line Grip Line Scale. You could search those two, but there's a lot of load cells out there. Um, and Max has asked a, a good question. Is anyone collating injury data between schools, training centers, like uh, Ridder in, in the UK? So, doubt it. Yeah, I doubt it too. I mean, uh, uh, one of the w w there has been a discussion um, around some sort of centralised way of doing this for circus schools. Um, a yeah. very small discussion um, because not everyone's happy to see their injury data um, sort of uh, out there in um, public. 
Um, not that there is a vast amount of it, but you know there is obviously injury data there which can highlight and uh, you know some people may see it as harming their reputations. But there is a requirement under Riddor um, for reporting um, a, a, a lot of these sorts of things. But the, you know I, I tend to think that it's definitely worthwhile knowing about the big injuries that happen, um, but the ones that will make um, a, a difference over time, apart from obviously those things, is the smaller injuries that occur through training that you don't, that are niggles and things that don't get reported. Um, and those uh, smaller and more frequent things may actually have a larger impact on someone's development in a, in a particular art form. Yeah, Marion's uh, research sounds great. That sort of research at the yeah. other end of the load path, essentially. I, I mean, yeah. so yeah. much of how we behave in uh, work at height in industry is based on this. I mean, what is it, half a century old tiny research thing into, you know, where the 12 kilonewton come from and the, and the knock on effect of that into the strength of anchors and yeah. the ball protection equipment. It's, I mean, it's probably an area that doesn't get that much of a look at considering the impact it has on, on working life generally at height. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, what was the, uh, just picking up on the last one of those comments that I've just been looking at there. Um, Chris, what, what was the name of that um, load cell that you said that you've been working with recently? Oh, Elon. Elon, okay, thank you. E-I-L-O-N. I mean, I could probably get, if, if we're interested, um, I mean, he's a great guy and he doesn't sort of bang the company drum too much. He's more interested in safety. Um, but I could get Elan Bahar, who's um, the yeah. technical director, I think, um, to do a presentation, he's done it for me many times. That would be amazing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, w I think like being able to get some of these people to come in and have these uh, conversations would actually be hugely beneficial. Um, mm. We do have a slot in September or a, a bigger one in October um, uh, that will be coming up. One second, let me just um, pop over to. Uh, let me find this. We're going to have a quick look at what's uh, coming up. Um, and then we'll uh, carry on from there. So I'm just on the uh, circusrigging.info um, site and want to have a scroll down to see what's coming up in October. So one of the things we're doing October the 5th to the 7th, um, we're uh, looking to do, this is what we've uh, publicised that's out there so far. Um, uh, Brett Copes has um, agreed to do a stunt rigging session. Um, so as in particularly stunt rigging for circus shows, um, which uh, I, I had a big interest in. Um, we're going to continue with the theme of understanding factors of safety and things like that. I don't know if it'll be this form because we've already done a live stream version of that um, subsequently and force testing data and conclusions. Now, um, I, I would assume that the uh, the person who'll be giving this will be uh, slightly different and um, I'm dying to see if um, some of Marion's research um, uh, will be published beforehand and I've already asked her if she would be uh, willing to as soon as it's ready uh, which uh, she said she'd be more than happy to uh, to come along and do that. Um, some of the other things we've spoken about are rigging structures um, and um, Total and uh, Fire Toys are happy to talk about their uh, rigging structures um, so we can understand some of the science behind it and uh, we can talk to people. And I've got another one which is a, a specialist rig which is not specifically circus but is hanging people off of uh, which I'm trying to get agreement of for people to do that because they're quite into um, the engineering um, methodologies for doing that and coming up with something unique which would be really interesting to see from a rigging structure perspective. Um, there's, there's been a requirement for uh, that's been coming in from people um, looking at what we need for training in circus. So what I'd very much like to do is to be able to talk about um, rigging in the entertainment industry. I have a suspicion we've got someone who could speak somewhat authoritatively about that. I'm not necessarily going to ask Chris to come and um, teach us what he does for a day job um, for free. Um, but uh, to be able to position some of these things would be um, uh, quite useful. Um, and also, uh, uh, you know, errata as well. Because some of the, th the issues that we're seeing for artists in venues in Scotland, for example, is that venues are saying that you need someone with a, a, a national rigging certificate to come in because you've got a Chinese pole to rig. And obviously there's a big mismatch in understanding for um, what the skills of an NRC rigger are and um, what the skills of someone who's come out of the National Centre um, with a degree in Chinese pole is able to rig and uh, isn't. So um, that's definitely something that would be in there. Um, some of the other things we want to do is, is put a little panel together of what rigging training we need so we can continue to have that discussion and have a look at, at some of those um, elements uh, in there. Um, 
an open discussion session um, also um, for artists, schools and venues. Um, I've been having a chat with um, um, uh, Tom from the National Centre and um, uh, Will Cleary from um, Sweden. Um, uh, uh, looking at the uh, training and safety requirements within FedEx type schools um, so that we can have a wider discussion about um, what sort of um, safety uh, commonalities should be in people's training as they go through um, their life as a, uh, a an artist and, and certainly from a, a Scottish perspective there's everything from training spaces where you can drop in and do your thing um, all the way through to funded places where you can do residences and things like that and there's a very wide variety of requirements um, but still within a lot of the venues here um, no is the easiest answer when someone wants to come and do something in your theatre um, because there isn't the understanding there so we're looking at ways that we can work with organisations like the Federation of Scottish Theatre by putting on um, you know a, a appropriate rigging training for um, Scottish venues and we've done live ones out in fact some of the footage that you saw playing today actually came from one of those um, courses that we ran in Glasgow um, and teaching circus um, we've all been through a, a, a pandemic where everything went online um, so if we're looking at circus and safety, and this isn't just teaching rigging, um, but teaching rigging could be a part of that, but teaching circus, what role should digital learning play? Um, so those are different elements that we're looking at there. So i um, just going to switch back to the team. Um, one second. My ability to quickly do this. Uh, I, need, I need better toys for uh, orchestrating this and VJing it whilst presenting. Um, so um, those are what we've got lined up that's been discussed so far and we've tried to put in place some of those sessions for October 5th to the 7th. Um, I'm hoping that uh, um, you guys may have some input into some of those areas. Absolutely. One, one point, if I can just steal the, um, the limelight from the NRC for a second. Please. Don't forget, the NRC is only assessment, it's not training. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'll, ch I'll chime in as well. I, I, I'm NRC and, and, and IRATA, and IRATA is uh, not rigging, is, is, is a common misconception. I mean, they rig ropes uh, for themselves yeah. to hang in to work, but that's the extent of it. It's, it's not a rigging. Course. So I think both are quite quite misunderstood. Both brilliant systems, yeah. but um, both have their own scope, and 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 circus isn't directly yeah. in either of them. But equally, the word rigging. The word rigging is the big problem uh, yeah. in every sector. It really yeah. is. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, th this is. I, I mean, like I've um, had to navigate that for all of the time here because Glasgow City Council wouldn't let us rig in a circus tent without an NRC rigger who'd never like they had one on tap but it's like I've never been in a circus tent before this is really interesting so we had to navigate that very carefully with them because they were like well if you're not using him you're not doing it um, so we managed to um, work to it was like well we'll show you what we've done and if you like it you can just sign off on it um, obviously it was more expensive for them the thing to do is to start compiling lists of the circus riggers or um, aerial riggers that are also NRC and yeah. it's the same with Arati, you know, if you when you corner them about it, because we've we've had problems with that for years, certainly before the NRC came along. Yeah. Oh, you need an errata qualification to work in the roof in this building. Yeah. So what you do is it's actually a lot cheaper to train an engineer to be a rope access technician than it is the other way around for obvious yeah, reasons. Yeah. <laughs> no disrespect to the rope access world, but you know what I mean. Um, but if you've got an engineering degree and you're an NRC rigger and you've got an errata ticket and an iPad ticket and, 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 you know, that that's what it's all about, isn't it? That's how you make yourself extremely employable. <laughs> well, I mean, just looking in the, the list of names, we've got two or three there that I know for a fact have got the qualifications in most of those areas and they've got circus experience, you know, without mentioning any names. They know who yeah. they are. Yeah, they know who they are. Absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's good. But I, 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 a lot of the circumstances that we find here, there are obviously good riggers in Scotland um, and uh, also rope access people and uh, sort of uh, other elements like that and good circus riggers. But I mean, the, the most common instance that I 
come across here um, is uh, artists who fundamentally do know how to rig their own equipment but are not allowed to and then discussions between them and putting on performances in different venues if they're trying to build a tour um, is remarkably difficult because there isn't the infrastructure in place and the understanding in place to be able to yeah. to do that so there's yeah so I think there's a few up and coming uh, discussions in that area. So uh, anything you guys would like to uh, finish with um, for today? Keep on talking. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, very keen to uh, continue the discussion. Um, we'll decide what we're going to be um, uh, putting out in uh, September. Um, at the moment, I think the discussion may well be around the subject of uh, uh, load cells because uh, we've got some good opportunities there. Um, but a lot of things that I'm going to be doing during September is uh, doing a lot of filming for the technical symposium because the intention is to have it in Aerial Edge's new venue if it's open when this happens uh, so that it can be streamed from a studio all that the timing that we're looking at there it might just be a yeah, building site um, so we never know um, but equally having uh, people to be able to contribute um, online um, using something like this but also making it more interesting because last year we did get I think nearly a hundred people or so um, in to uh, the Zoom room and I absolutely know that we're not going to get that happening again because uh, people are just too fed up with it. So um, this has been shown to be a little bit more um, engaging and successful so we still need to collate a little bit more in the way of um, uh, additional media assets to, to keep that level of in, engagement and interest going and also make it a, a higher quality event in its own right. So that's part of the intention um, uh, there which is good. Um, so I'm just checking to see if we've um, missed uh, anything in there. So uh, we've obviously gone over the hour because, you know, we like to talk. Um, there's been some good things uh, in, in the comments there. And um, uh, Brian Donaldson's name has come up, of, of course, a good uh, a friend to all of us and mentor in my case uh, uh, as well, which has been good. Um, and uh, also some other stuff. So uh, please feel free to continue the uh, conversation. Um, also, if you want to email me um, through the site, uh, then we can uh, continue the conversation there. Part of Circus Rigging and Safety, we have a uh, Slack group for this. So anyone who's a member um, and or who wants to become a member, um, feel free. The idea of the membership is just to support paying for what we do because we do it for free because we love it. Um, we wouldn't do it for free if there was another way, but um, it, it uh, uh, means that we can produce good quality information and help to educate people um, but there's a lot of things which go into making that like video f um, uh, creation and editing uh, article editing and things like that and it's good to be able to pay people professionally um, and also um, if we've got people who are um, going to be presenting and who have been out of work because of the pandemic and things like that then it's nice to be able to um, pay people for their contributions as well so um, uh, if for, for those of you who like this, first of all, like and subscribe. Um, and um, second of all, if you want to come and join up um, on the site, you can just join the mailing list and you'll get notified for any of these that are coming out. If you subscribe to um, this, you'll see um, any of the latest information that's coming up there. So firstly, big thanks to Mariam um, for her contribution and time and effort. Um, second of all, huge thanks to Chris um, and big thanks to uh, Ryan and also your um, uh, rigging assistant that you've got there with you. That's the foreman. Yeah. Oh, the foreman. Sorry, that's actually the yeah. boss. I hadn't realised. That's excellent. All right, guys. Well, thank you all very much for your um, your time and your input today. Um, and um, if anybody else wants to uh, join in and contribute in their own way, then um, please um, come and do so because uh, you'd be uh, very welcome as, as far as that's concerned. But um, thanks, guys. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to um, finish the stream here and uh, we'll uh, continue on um, with more information coming up uh, um, in future. Thanks very much to having a great and interactive audience too, which is really good. Thanks, Matt.